So um, again, I feel like we're preaching to the choir here. The, um, the uses of cannabis and hemp are very, very well documented. Um, and especially here in, in the state of Oregon, we um, definitely have a high level of consciousness with that. Um, the reason I use <laughs> The reason I use the term smells like here is um, because I last year I was on a radio talk show here and the host said to me, you know, Sophia, people are really complaining about the smell of all of the cannabis and hemp farms around here. What do you have to say to that? And I said, you know, to me, it smells like jobs. It smells like an alternative to plastic. It smells like, you, you know, a, a possible renaissance of the American small family farm. It smells like a, a, a new platform, not only for economic revival, but here again, um, a platform for positive social change, for um, a positive shift to a more ecological way of doing things. So um, we had a pretty animated discussion there. Uh, <laughs> let me see what, it, excuse me for one second. Oh, okay. Here we go. Now it's working. Hey, okay. so, um, in my work with the, the hemp university and now with the, the Caputo group, um, you know, I can see that as an emerging sector, um, you know, this community, really needs to cultivate its grassroots culture. And no, that wasn't a pun when I wrote it, but it turned into a pun, so I hope you enjoy that. Um, we need to associate with each other. We need to know who this community is, the members of this community. We need to see each other. We need to look each other in the eye, and we need to start building those key relationships and the internal cohesion that's going to um, help us move forward, you know, not only in the sense of, you know, contraband to commodity, but what is it that we want to build with this shift? So um, that's one of the things that we did in the, the Hemp University um, uh, symposiums that I organized at Southern Oregon University. It was about um, getting to know each other. It was about sharing knowledge, building relationships, and starting to build that trust so that we can then move on to a discussion of, you know, what are our shared values within this community? What are our visions for this crop as it becomes a commodity? And how can we work together to set sustainable standards for where this industry is going? Um, and then lastly, you know we need to associate because we need to start aggregating our voices together so that we can actively participate in those processes that are affecting our lives and our livelihoods. Um, I remember last fall when the um, total THC regs hit, um, when they dropped and how that affected the industrial hemp community. Um, it just absolutely sent shockwaves through, uh, through the entire industry. And there was quite a bit of um, gnashing of the teeth. And, you know, together with the Caputo group, we, uh, we made an effort to, you know, to organize people and to help them understand this legislative process and to also help them understand how they can and should be participating in those processes. Oh dear, why is it not moving? I apologize, I'm gonna, um, I feel like I'm a little bit stuck here. Hang on just a second. It's kind of, it's not letting me advance my, it's making that, okay. Hmm. It's always technical issues with these stupid meetings. I'm so sorry <laughs> about that. I wish I wish I could. Um, I wish I knew what was. Oh, okay. So that's interesting. Okay. So um, 
Oregon, um, as, as you know, those of you who know me um, have heard me say this repeatedly, you know, we have so many advantages here in the state um, in terms of cultivating excellence in cannabis and hemp. We are definitely a growth pole. Um, this state has the biomes, the soil, the climate, and the latitude that are most propitious for the cultivation of um, these strains. We are definitely a knowledge pole. Um, Oregon has a high concentration of experienced growers. Um, so there's a lot of expertise that is concentrated here. And truly, um, the world does look to Oregon as a um, knowledge center in terms of cannabis and hemp. And then, of course, we have um, universities like OSU with the Global um, Hemp Innovation Center that are coming online, too, to be able to... Um, participate in this discussion of regional identity for this crop. And what do we mean by that? We mean that, you know, there is a big potential for the state of Oregon to become the Napa Valley of cannabis and hemp, not unlike how Napa Valley, for example, teams up with UC Davis to be their knowledge pole for their um, fine craft wines. So, Oregon has every advantage to be able to engender not only an economic revival with this crop, but also an ecological revival, and I truly believe a social revival as well. So let me see if I can, oh wow, check it out. Okay, <laughs> we're going. So some of the challenges that I've seen, and of course, you know, I, I'm really glad that we're having this um, discussion together and that Teresa has, you know, made this forum possible. Personally, I feel that reefer madness still prevails in the, you know, the attitudes of the legislation that I've seen coming forward um, regarding this crop. Um, I did, read through the um, interim final rules last year when they came out for industrial hemp um, because I'm fond of torturing myself. Um, <laughs> but you know, we, if you read through the legislation, it really doesn't sound like legislation that is interested in advancing a crop forward into the, the status of a commodity. It is more around law enforcement and paranoia about THC. And so I feel that, you know, we have candidates like Teresa that are more open-minded towards this crop, that we can start to have a more progressive attitude in the laws that are um, governing its cultivation, its use, its, and its sale, and its role in society because there still is a lot of stigma that is attached to it and you know that comes with the cultural project um, of of you know mainstreaming cannabis more um, you know we also one of the challenges that we face is you know anytime something proves itself to be a viable cash crop uh, you know big pharma an agribusiness start to loom on the horizon as well. And, um, you know, one of our local farmers down here, Paul Murdoch of Corn Creek Hemp, he made a, gr a really great point last year. He said, you know, it's not your local um, farmer down the street, the, the guy that's farming down the street from you, that is not your enemy. R.J. Reynolds is your enemy. And this is where it points to my last point on this page is this lack of internal cohesion in these communities. Um, it's absolutely imperative, I feel, for us to you know, cultivate our communities, cultivate trust, that internal cohesion, keep these conversations open, keep these de debates open to help us work on a positive map forward for the advancement of this crop. Is everybody okay? Am I going too fast? We good? OK. 
I'm good. I'm just, uh, I'm scared from what you told me. I'm just like, wow, this is crazy. But thank you. And I'm listening. Okay. Well, this is where, you know, <laughs> the type of leadership that, you know, that we in, in, envision for the advancement of this crop into a proper commodity are, you know, from, from my point of view, it's threefold. Candidates who would recognize the economic opportunity of cannabis hemp and, and hemp, its power to revive local and state economies, the ecological opportunity of cannabis and hemp. Um, you know, we have an opportunity, like I said earlier, to do things differently and to structure the advancement of this crop along more sustainable and ecological um, lines. And then of course, the social opportunity of cannabis and hemp, um, the, the, the reemergence of the American small family farm, extending the, um, the, the benefits of this, of this crop, you know, as a medicine and also as an economic opportunity to um, groups who may not have had, um, you know, equal access, um, like women, people of color, and so on and so on. So again, I, I, I really, you know, one of the reasons that I'm so gung ho about this crop is because I really, really feel that it's holding out the opportunity for us to do things differently and to evolve. So just to wrap it up, here at the Caputo Group, we, um, in addition to the other craft industries that we serve, we do serve the cannabis and hemp industry um, in the areas of staffing, HR payroll, and compliance needs. Um, we support this industry through value-added initiatives like this one. Um, we support a lot of networking, event sponsorship, content development, and webinars. And next Thursday, um, April 23rd at noon, um, we will be um, hosting another webinar for employer responsibilities amid the COVID-19 pandemic, but with a special focus on cannabis and hemp industries. And so our special guests that day will be Jesse, Jesse Bonticu. Oh, hey, Jesse. Oh, it's good to see you. Okay, so Jesse is from the Oregon Retailers of Cannabis Association. And then we're also going to be welcoming Todd Key from the Greenlight Law Group. And uh, down at the bottom is just a link if you would like to um, access um, that webinar. And I also, I don't mind putting it in um, the chat or the comments. So that's it for me. Um, thank you so much for, um, for having me, Teresa. Thank you so much, Sophia. And I'm sorry, my name is pronounced Teresa. And I know oh. some people online are probably like, why don't you tell her? But I didn't want to interrupt. Oh, so. okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Ter Ter Teresa. Ter <laughs> Teresa. Yes. Okay. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. I am so thankful for that information because it opens up space for us to have this conversation now. Um, a lot of people know that I've demanded audits and I utilize audits as a resource to kind of have an overview of what's going on in our city and regarding our budgets and where that money is going and why we're not seeing um, the things that we want to see. I remember when Anthony Johnson and Madeline uh, Martinez were pushing for the new approach and then they started doing the, le the legislation for other retail components and I remember that when we were fighting for legalization we had a lot of people in participation in regards to civics right everybody was registering to vote everybody was making sure that they posted their ballots in the mail but once we got in and we had to iron out all the little uh, the pieces, like what you just showed us in, in the legislation, um, people didn't realize that though we are legal, there are still a lot of things that are harming um, or not, or let's say are, are oppressing the industry and the people that are actually trying to provide a very quality product to people that they believe in and at the same time make social change happen. 
So your analysis of what's happening in the legislature and what that language looks like in regards to how law enforcement and the surveillance or the enforcement of, uh, of law and order over people um, is, you know, we're learning that through this COVID-19 that we've always had an opportunity through political will uh, to identify opportunities to house people and to get food to people and to deal with people in crisis, but it took a pandemic for us to make sure that those resources were available. And the fact that you have that information now, that means that on the front line, we can push the agendas that we know need to be in place. And the fact that we're an essential industry right now, um, that's very exciting because we don't know, I, and I'm not saying it like it's exciting because we have COVID-19, I don't want that to be any part of this, but the fact that we've been designated as an essential industry um, that means that we need to use political will to get more. And when I say more, I'm saying banking. I'm saying, I just see Dr. Knox come on. And when I saw her talk at Diversify Portland, she talked about social equity. But what really is that? How do we define that if everybody's not at the table? So um, right now, in my opinion, from now until November, these type of dialogues need to happen and we need to utilize them as a source of uh, communication and we need to share them in whatever manner we can so that people are excited about uh, registering the vote and also maintaining the presence and engagement with the industry and where we're at. Because, um, you know, like we're making this happen and we need to document what that looks like. I see James smiling. And so thank you, everybody. Um, we're here today because of my friend James Schwartz of Cascade Eye. And, um, <laughs> and so I'm thankful that he decided to support me. He gave me his endorsement. He's going to give me his money. Um, and he's also asked that we have an event. And we thought we were going to have this event at the commune and support that business and that industry um, of event and outreach. But we're not able to. So we're here virtually which uh, we get to record everything. And again, we get to share it with our networks and make sure that the key points are there. I'll have Doc do an edit for us. But uh, James, thank you so much for supporting me. And I'm not supposed to be the host, but I'm, I'm you know, I talk a lot. Thank you. Uh, well, <laughs> Teresa, I think that we're thankful for you and we're all here because of you. And, uh, you know, I thank Jesse for bringing you over to Orca, uh, that meeting. That was a great chance to, to meet you and hear a little bit about what you stood for and, and, and what you wanted to do. And, you know, I guess for me uh, in the industry, uh, you know, I was, I was really encouraged to see you embracing the industry and to also kind of bringing facts to light that I think a lot of us hadn't really thought about I, I um, number one really where that tax revenue is going um, and it was really interesting to see you know uh, that the largest majority I'll say somewhere between about 75 to 90 percent of that cannabis tax revenue is going to quote unquote public safety and all of the different forms that are characterized by that um, and, you know, as someone who's been in the city for 20 plus years, uh, to know that I'm having to send my daughter to school with, you know, supplies that we have to purchase and books that we have to purchase and, and pencils and everything else for these kids to be able to, to be educated in our schools, you know, that was uh, one of the things that was really frustrating for me. And then I, I guess, you know, we also see that, uh, you know, there's, there's construction all over the streets of Portland. Um, I think that we should be doing some, uh, you know, better work with those tax dollars, both in terms of our streets, but you know, our our public parks and 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 our you know our bike paths and everything that makes this city so livable and the and the reasons that we all want to be here. And it's frustrating to be in the industry get taxed on an effective tax rate of, you know, somewhere close to 70%. Uh, I'm sure Jesse can really get into the, some of the numbers with us. Um, and as soon as I'm done talking, I'm going to start bouncing some questions around to you guys. Cause I, you know, I, I, I think there's lots that we can do, but um, you know, it, it, when we start to talk about, you know, cannabis being an essential business, I, I, one of the things that I'm most frustrated by right now is, we are an essential business. Uh, we're, 
we're staying up and running. Um, I, thankfully, as a as a cultivator, I don't have a whole lot of interaction with the public other than you know when I'm having to go to to stores to drop off you know shipments of, of product to stores so that they can get it on their shelves and they're really the the face meeting the consumer. But you know we're an essential business. We pay an effective tax rate of seventy percent. And yet none of that stimulus money that's coming from the federal government is going to go to us. And then, you know, I was just listening to OPB today. There was, I think they said like 9,000 businesses that applied for the $1.4 million that the state was going to allocate, allocate to small businesses. Um, and they were going to, you know, they were, they were going to give it out to about 200 companies and, you know, I don't know if any of those include cannabis businesses, but it sure is interesting to to be the bastardized stepchild of the federal government and 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 even some to some degree the states. I mean, I'm thankful that we are an essential business because we you know it, we've we've had a, we've had to deal with enough in this industry that if we now had to close down uh, for yet another issue, uh, it would be really frustrating. Um, but it, it, it's, it's, it's really disheartening to think that we pay so much in taxes and none of our businesses qualify for those sorts of small business loans. Um, and like I said, potentially through the state, we could get something, but there's so many businesses that are equally as affected, if not more so than ours that I understand. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that there's, with current COVID issue, we've we've got our own set of issues. I just think it's bringing to light uh, a lot of those issues for the industry. I also <clears throat> am somewhat heartened that I think one of the other things that it brings to light is there's no problems getting product on shelves in dispensaries. And why is that? It's because it's a state market. It's businesses all within a state, within a solid geographic area. Um, we don't have international distribution channels. Now, I'm sure some of us would like those as well, but you know, I don't necessarily have to wait on something coming from China to be able to put my product out. And I think one of the things that the rest of the economy should be looking at is the fact that wow, all these cannabis businesses were able to continue to operate because they're already more or less self-sufficient within their uh, within their geographic locations. Now, that's not to say that if you're a processor who needs cartridges to get on the market, that you're not ex dealing with problems coming from China for something like that. But um, overall, the distribution of the market is there. Uh, you know, you've got your, your seed to sale uh, within the state industry already. And so I think there's some things that the federal government can be looking at with that and understanding what is important uh, in terms of when we move forward beyond this current crisis that we're in, um, how do we learn some lessons of, of, of some of the things that happened with COVID. Um, but in general, I'm, I'm happy to be here for you, Teresa. Um, I'm, I'm, would love to see uh, some new ideas coming to Portland. I'm encouraged that you're reaching out to the industry um, to help bring some of those ideas to the table and that you're looking at how we can repurpose some of those cannabis tax dollars to really going towards the things that support healthier communities, whether that's drug treatment or, or housing or education. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm enthusiastic to support you and, uh, for anybody that's on the call, um, and if we don't fill it with you guys, we'll put it out to everybody else. But, you know, I plan to, to sponsor the beer and wine for the mixer tonight. So I'm going to match, uh, up to $500 donations. So if any of you guys can cough up 25, I'll turn it into 50. Um, and, and we can get some money in Teresa's pocket. I, I know that we're getting closer to the deadline now. And uh, as a as a political candidate, Teresa, I, I, I can only imagine how this is a struggle for you trying to get out and, and, and shake hands and not shake hands and uh, 
uh, you know, and, and knock on doors without knocking on doors. But, you know, I know that you're repurposing your campaign the same way we're all looking at our own businesses and moving to virtual conferences and, and uh, telephone banking and, and that kind of stuff. And I encourage, you know, everybody that's on the call to try and do as much as we can. And um, hopefully we can all put some money in Teresa's coffers so that she can spend it on, you know, some, some real heavy marketing because the only way she's going to be really getting her name out there now is through, through social media and, and traditional media channels. And so uh, I hope that we can give her some revenue to work with to, to make that happen. So with that, uh, I'm happy to turn it over. I, I would like to hear Jesse jump in. I don't mean to skip over anybody else, but I, I think that he brings a lot of great policy stuff. And just from the emails that I see from Orca, you know, they've, they've been working hard with the state and I'd, I'd be interested to hear what they're talking about. All right, we'll give him. I don't know myself. <laughs> um, uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, Jesse Bonahue, um, Deputy Director of the Oregon Retailers of Cannabis Association. You know, and, and I think one of the, in talking to um, Teresa and James and, and other folks about this, it's um, just the, the civic engagement around cannabis is essential. Back in 2016, um, or sorry, 2018, we ran a campaign with retailers just reminding cannabis consumers to register to vote. Um, and I think we got into about 300 shops with posters reminding folks that, you know, uh, the or voters of Oregon brought, gave us legal cannabis. And without their continued support, it will get corrupted and ruined and we still might have it, but it won't be what we want. So it's just really important for people to be engaged. Um, and remember that the reason we're all here is because people voted. Um, so within that though, that's sort of my just little pitch of political engagement is awesome. Thank you for doing everything you can to encourage people and support people doing that. Um, we have been, as, as the trade association, um, doing a lot of outreach uh, and work with the, with the governor's office and the OLCC and to the legislator and as well as in Congress. Um, and the size of the problem that the, the state is facing, it's hard to kind of conceptualize. Um, I mean, they're talking about they're losing billions of dollars just like everybody else. Um, that being said, one of the things that's been, it, it's, you try and find a little bit of a silver lining. This is hard for a lot of, for a lot of industries. Uh, it's, you know, we're, we weren't closed down. So thank God. Right. Um, and so we were doing a little bit better than some, but the, um, this, the size of the problem is quite expansive and it's also given us a real clear opportunity to educate folks about how we are so vulnerable. Uh, you know, we are, we're allowed to function right now. So far we haven't been, suffered complete catastrophe as an industry. Um, but the time to ask for aid is not after we suffer that catastrophe. It's to ask for it beforehand, or at least make sure we're able to um, apply and qualify just like every other legal business. And so that's been our message um, to these folks. And it, you know, we've had the opportunity to educate some folks about, hey, we don't even have bankruptcy court. So if this goes really bad, it's a whole level, additional level of insanity for these folks. And I think one of the key things that, you know, and so it's just, we've had, a, it's been very, it's been great to hear back from people that they really do are beginning to see the challenges and uh, threats that the industry faces. And also truly understand how important it is to folks. I will say that our tax contributions to the state are, very appreciated right now <laughs> at a time when they're losing like $1.2 billion from the lottery fund for us to be able to continue generating a large amount of taxes. I think last month, you know, I think last month it was $77 million in taxable revenue that um, the industry generated, not taxes, Jesse, but we were able to be taxed. That was the revenue that was taxed. Jesse, do you think that now is a good time for us really to be trying to hammer some of these folks like, Hey, look at the weight that we're pulling for you guys. Like, I mean, how do we, <laughs> I mean, everything with respect, but yes, like, um, you know, like, and that's what we've been, you know, we've been doing and they've been, they've been getting it. And I've been told directly by people in the governor's office. Yes, we understand 
the challenges and threats facing to the industry. Um, and they wanted to be encouraging to a degree, <laughs> but they also wanted to be honest. And so they said, you know, it's like, but the size of the problem is even hard to explain to, to anybody. So please know that we do fully understand how, how vulnerable you are um, and that we are going to do the best we can for the most number of people. Um, and we just, but also at the time when I had that conversation, the state also doesn't even know how the Fed, the federal dollars are going to work yet. So that's the other challenge. Um, is they are trying to figure out what all these federal promises and programs are actually even going to look like in reality on the ground for them with money. So it's a very complicated situation, um, but it it is giving us an opportunity to really show exactly our role in the community um, and our importance and the ability to generate tax revenue um, and do good. I would just say the one thing is is if anybody's on here. Uh, don't do anything on 420 that is special <laughs> we, we need to be very careful about not getting bad images but short of that um you know i i think this is a, a real it's been a very interesting and challenging op moment but i have seen some very encouraging things from elected officials with them really beginning to understand it um i will also say though that, that there are people out there talking about shutting down the whole industry their organizations um at uh, advocating for against alcohol and against cannabis at this very moment i have gotten pressure from elected officials and so that's part of the other piece of the story is we cannot ever sleep we're like the low-hanging fruit we're an easy target we are all have to be we all have to be united because we're stronger together and we are still a target we are a political target we're an economic target um and and, and so we have to have, our, you know, we have to be ready to fight. And you know, it's, it's just real blunt. Yeah. And I think that gets back to Sophia's uh, presentation with, you know, working together with our, with our agencies. Um, and so, you know, I, I'd like to, I know Kim's on the conversation and, and you're here and, uh, and Takara from Diversify, you know, I, I think it's really important that we, you know, at times like these really start to come together and, and, and work together as, a, as an industry whole uh, rather than, you know, kind of our own self-interest on any particular piece. Absolutely. We're all we got. And that's what we heard from Sophia about what's happening in the legislature. I mean, that language, there's so much to look through and to read through. And the fact that she gave us such a concise informational, um, you know, spreadsheet of it. Um, that shows you that those barriers are intentional and that they're still happening, even though we came in with a social justice lens. And so saying that um, leads me to the importance of Diversify Portland and the fact that not only did I meet Dr. Knox at, the so at that event, but that she talked about social equity. So I wanted Takara to kind of talk to us about the importance of what she does. And that is a lot of what we've all talked about, which is bringing people together um, so that we do build political power, because I know that that has to be intentional. It doesn't just happen. And especially in an industry that we've used for whether it was medication or whether it was to, you know, escape anxiety in the world. Um, we never had political advantages, and we still don't, from what Sophia is saying, if we don't get engaged, if we're not engaged, and that has to be all of us, um, because I think that the power that the organizations that want to shut everything down, it comes from our lack of community. It, la it, showed, it comes from our lack of ability to build solidarity amongst the entire cannabis community and the hemp community. So we have to do better at doing that. And we have a frontliner on this as a speaker and I would love, you know, hey girl. <laughs> Tagara. Hi, I had to unmute it. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, great. <laughs> so I don't know why I expected to hear everybody say yes back. Um, well, hi you guys. Uh, so one, I just wanna say, I wanna thank everyone for coming on and, and being a part of this conversation. I think that making sure that our other allies in this industry are all on the same page. So having meetings like this are very important. Um, I think to even maybe really have on a, on a regular, just to make sure that we're all carrying out forward together with what needs to be done. Um, COVID, I guess, is bringing things together in that way um, because we all have our own meetings within our own groups, but bringing those different groups together 
and being allies toward us, you know, making sure that we're being strategic with our movements and legislative and just kind of all being on the same page about who we're voting for, making sure that we're getting things um, pushed in the direction that's going to lead us to where we need to be in the city is really important. So great job, everybody, for being on here. Um, so Diversify Portland, I do want to clarify some things too. So um, the event that happened on March 7th and 8th was the National Cannabis Diversity Awareness Convention. Um, that is not a Diversify Portland event. Uh, Diversify Portland is <clears throat> more so like, it's a homemade, a Portland movement towards business, towards helping the, our city be more diverse and business, giving businesses an opportunity to show off their support for diversity. So I throw diversity events in the city um, and I allow different businesses to be a part of those events um, as allies towards making sure that we are all being diverse in our hiring practices, in our customers, um, if we are having our own events that we're out there doing, if you are having trouble with having your events be diverse, people know they can come to me, I'll help them make sure that their events have a wide variety of people there, um, help people dig into those target markets that are maybe a little harder for them to reach and things of that nature. Um, so Diversify Portland's more of a, it's just more like a little, it's a movement that I started. I really would love to see people using the hashtag when they're taking pictures so we can see everyone's faces and who's all a part basically of just of our community here and show just all the faces I support diversifying this city basically. Um, so, you know, that's what that is and how it came about. Uh, I'm, I'm a part of the cannabis community. I have been since before it was legal. And I've just noticed that every time there's cannabis events, um, now, so it's getting a little better, but I was the only person of color there. I got tired of being the only black person at parties. So I just started going my own parties and, figured hey now you come over to my in my space it's going to be actually diverse because i associate and i talk with everybody and i love everybody and i don't pick who i who i invite as far as based on race or color and i like to uh encourage my friends that do do that kind of behavior to step outside of their social boxes and come to a diverse high portland event so they can be able to mingle and expand their social circles um, in directions maybe where they hadn't before. I've had a lot of people come to one of my events and be like, this is the first time I came to uh, an event. And I've done events at my house too. <laughs> They've been like, this is the first time I've ever been to a black person's house. I'm like, that's crazy, how is it? You know, <laughs> you know? And, and it's just, it really helps expand things, honestly, um, and expanding people's perspective and expanding their social circles, they take that social growth within themselves and they take it back into their businesses as well. At least it's encouraged anyway. And we do discuss it to take that social growth back into your businesses, take that back with your employees, um, encourage other people to grow. And, um, you know, and it's about putting your feet and your money where your mouth is. Um, that's, that's one thing that I definitely do encourage people to do because I see a lot of, I learned a new a new word uh, from a gentleman named Joe Leary, actually, called lip service, um, where people, they say one thing, but they do another. And I've experienced that a lot in the cannabis community when it comes to actually um, this whole, I'm gonna say diversity trend, because when I started doing events, I was very serious about the diversity movement. And I feel as though um some that it's almost trending now like people are saying they're for diversity but you're not actually seeing them do the things that are gonna create actual equitable growth towards a more diverse uh community in our cannabis community um and you know there's uh i feel like we should come up with i would like to see a plan from our leaders, since we are talking to a candidate, I, I personally would like to see a plan where accountability is gonna be a part of um, our equity plan. Uh, I think that allowing people to just put um, on their applications that they have partnerships with um, businesses that are black owned or from indigenous background. I think just saying you have a partnership is, partnership is not enough. I like to see um, actual guaranteed hours, like when it comes to these bids, 
um, and money grants going towards people. People are, I've noticed, still getting a lot of access to things just by saying they're associated with black or indigenous people with no actual accountability. And so personally, I'm, I'm a big on accountability. Um, and, and I would like to see, I would like to see more accountability go into the industry. Cause right now I feel like I'm getting a lot of lip service. Um, I feel like, <clears throat> I feel like people can do better. Um, I feel like why we're on this call here, I'd like to see us actually raise some funds to support Teresa. Um, instead of just talking about it, be about it. James, I definitely heard what you said about, uh, matching the 500. Um, <clears throat> I don't, I don't, uh, I, I have a match for that. I want to put in, you know what I'm saying? I don't have much money, but I'm, I'm broke. Y'all know that, but I got a hundred on it. <laughs> so on the match, I got a hundred on the match right there. So I'm put my money where my mouth is right now. You know what I'm saying? And, um, just became 200. What, what'd you say now? Your hundred just became 200. All right. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I want to, I want to keep that going. You know what I'm saying? And I want to, and I hope that each little box clicks in and somebody, I don't care if y'all put up $10, $25. I hope that all of us that's on this call, you know what I'm saying, reaches in and taps into what's really needed. Um, and also, uh, I would like to see, I, I definitely would like to see uh, the groups that are able to be of a financial support. I would like to see you guys stepping up into the black and indigenous community in the cannabis industry and being a, a more support for them, whether it's you helping them raise the funds or putting up the dollars yourself. Um, but I think that uh, there's some awesome people on this call today that can be of a better service to the people of color that's in this industry. Um, and, and I personally would like, to, would like to see that, especially from the Caputo group. I would like to see that um, you guys step up and really and help out a little more financially. Um, you know, we could talk about it, but I want to I want to see you guys be about it. I, I, I know a lot about your guys' group, so I'm going to say that out loud because I just think is we got to move toward a toward a change where we're all really working together and, and not just jumping in where we look good, but really let's really do let's really put put something forward. And we have a candidate here. We have a few awesome candidates right now, you guys. We got some awesome people that's ready to come in and make some great changes. Um, but accountability is going to be the number one thing that's going to get shit done. So, you know, I'm glad that we got who we have here for this mayor candidate. And um, I'm really excited to see uh, <laughs> someone who knows about accountability <laughs> and transparency and community growth and really bringing people together. And I think that you being in a seat like that is a huge loop for this state. Um, they're not used to seeing women in power positions, let alone black women. Um, so I look forward to helping you. Um, Thank you. With, uh, getting, getting, we gotta get those votes up and media, you know, getting <laughs> your name out, like, uh, you know, was mentioned earlier, really getting out, making sure everybody knows who you are is important. And I know that uh, I, I talked with our, one of our main radio stations here. And I just want to say while we're on the line, um, you know, we talked about 500, but I think we need to raise $1,200 if we can while we're on this call or get as close to it if possible. Um, even if we carry on and reach out to our networks after the call and just even, you know, maybe some promises to reach out to the network or something. Um, but we need $1,200 to do a week run on the radio and that can help. Um, and that's on our main radio station here in Portland, or like with Z100 or something, it's 1200 bucks to do a radio run. And, and I'll say my treasurer, Denise Braxton is on, and she's the one who does all of our compliance with the Secretary of State. So if that is exactly what that, that donation is for, she will make sure that we get that transaction on the record so that we can make it happen. Thank you to Carl. So that's what that is, I already looked into it. So that's, so that's a, like a little deal or, what not that it got worked out, but I can get that carried <clears throat> that carried over into writing. Um, so I can get that to whoever you need, but let's do this. Yes. To that, Takara, thank you for your kind. And we got Dr. Knox back. I just, I just wanted to say just on so many points that the information that you just shared and everything everywhere where you were coming from um, 10 years ago in September of 2010, my nephew got killed in gun violence in downtown Portland. 
and we've never gotten a fair investigation. We still don't know who killed this kid. And there were over 200 people outside because it was a Saturday night, um, almost Sunday morning. And he was 19 years old, going to the whiskey bar right there on uh, Cooch, all age event or whatever. Um, I guess it wasn't the whiskey bar where he was going, but it's the same area. Um, I think it was like the Barracuda or something at the time. But the fact that um, at the time when I was trying to work with the mayor and the health department and the city to kind of get an investigation into what was happening with the gun violence in our community, um, they, they kind of used marijuana as an issue of, of a problem, right? They were, you know, like everything that had to do with poverty or use of marijuana, or if you're skipping school or any of that, like that kind of determined that your life wasn't that valuable anyway, right? And so it became a problem for me because I said, wait, you know what? So as someone that grew up in this city where we've been harmed so much, when I, when I did start smoking weed, um, that was how I escaped that trauma. And I didn't care as much. And I was able to focus on the things that were important to me because I had something that wasn't a narcotic, um, it wasn't alcohol. Um, it wasn't suicide. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't something that was really deadly for me, but it kept me in a, in a place where I knew that I was somebody. And, and that kind of made me feel like we had to do whatever we could to not only uh, end stigma, but also to decriminalize it in every way and to turn it around and make it an asset, which to me is always an investment. Um, and we can't lose that opportunity because that's why I volunteered. That's why I used to make calls, knock on doors. I had everybody in my community volunteering because we really did believe that it was going to be an equalizer for us. And the community that was standing up for it were people just like us. They like how you started your conversation, James, saying you felt like the bastard child. Come on. You know what I'm saying? So in that time, it was like, they understand. They've been treated the same way. This is family. So we do have a time. We just got through with a, a, a horrendous decade um, that brought us together. And what are we going to do? What is our focus over the next 10 years? I know I'm going to do two terms in City Hall. And I know that everything that we're talking about discussing and working on is going to be uh, realized in that time. And right now, what we're doing right now, pulling everybody together, it's intentional. It's not a wish. It's not a, a, a dream. <laughs> um, it's intentional. It's out of necessity. And we're there. And I just wanted to thank Dr. Knox for being here. And I wanted to hear more. I know that we didn't get to show up to any of those social equity board meetings or any of those commission meetings because of what's going on now, but can you, you know, give us some insight on who you are for people that don't know and what your work is and how we can be uh, engaged. You have to take your mute, you have to take your mute off. You have to unmute. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hear you now. Okay. My internet is doing crazy things, so I didn't want the internet to, to ruin the video and the audio transmission through the computer, so I've called in also. So I was here, I heard everything, really glad to be a part of this conversation, and um, man, we have some really incredible folks on, on the line with you, Teresa, this, this is awesome. Um, a few things that I heard, right off the bat, I'm gonna answer your question, though, were themes of accountability, and collective power and collaboration and um, integrity. You know, I think that cannabis and the regulatory paradigm around it has, has is lacking a lot of accountability. So, you know, I serve the state in a couple of ways. I'm the chair of the Oregon Cannabis Commission. I also serve the Cannabis Policy Oversight Team for Portland that has done a lot of advisory work over the last year and a half with respect to how our cannabis tax dollars are being allocated in Portland. Um, and what folks may not know is that our cannabis tax dollars in Portland are being divvied up between the uh, PBOT, the Police Bureau, and our social equity endeavors. Now, PBOT and the Portland Police Bureau, they get ongoing, meaning, meaning continual funds year after year from the cannabis tax revenue, um, whereas our social equity programs have to reapply for that money every single year. So, that, so every year that, this, that social equity program, so um, Office of Community and Civic Life or Prosper Portland, 
has used some funds to offer grants and to support small businesses and businesses of color, they've had to reapply for that, wherein police get it every year. Now, I was at the hearing at City Hall a month ago where commissioners asked the, the Portland police, this year, can you tell us how you've used those funds? Can you demonstrate that you've used it to the limitation that is defined in statute? For two years in a row, the answer was, oh, nope, we can't. Yet the commissioners continue to ask Prosper Portland and the Office of Civic and Community Life to demonstrate to them why they need to keep applying for that money. And what was mostly remarkable to me was that um, the Office of Community and Civic Life and Prosper Portland were the only agencies or bureaus or offices who were able to provide data to demonstrate a return on investment for two years in a row. And so that to me was striking. To me, that means the narrative of cannabis is not well understood. It's not succinct. I think we're losing people. And I think one of the reasons why we're losing people is, is exactly what you said. We're not collaborating with one another. We have rogue narratives around cannabis. What is it? Is it a medicine? Is it, is it a recreational substance? Um, you know, Jesse, there's, you mentioned the concern of cannabis being regarded no differently than alcohol at this time. And it, you know, coming under threat of getting shut down amidst this crisis. The issue is we're not talking about cannabis as medicine anymore. We've gone rogue. We don't talk loudly about cannabis as therapy. We don't talk loudly as cannabis as a tool to wield to, um, to claim reparative justice and community restoration in our communities of color and how all of those things intersect. So I think right now our accountability needs to be to this plant and to what we want this industry to look like. And am I echoing you guys? Just a, a bit, Rachel, but it's probably because you got that phone and your computer on at the same time. Yeah. Now we can't hear you. No. Uh, So I'm just going to jump in and say thank you to everybody who's already chipping in and to Cara to make sure you understood. Yeah. Can you guys hear me now? Oh, go yeah. for it. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, we hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, so my, my point is that right now we want cannabis to be regarded as essential business. Why? Because cannabis protect, provides health and healing for people. You know, I think our government in Oregon has been very careful not to use the term essential. Um, it's, it just hasn't been um, told to shut down, whereas other states have gone so far as to call it essential, but for a health and wellness purpose. So I think right now we have the opportunity, somebody said opportunity, to really shift the narrative around cannabis. How can we use cannabis, um, its legalization, its taxation, and the 50,000 plus industrial uses to write the narrative that we want around cannabis. Do we want to regard it as a, a wellness substance, you know, at the least, as a medical substance at the most? Well then both industry and patients and the BIPOC communities all need to rally around that narrative and start demanding that we use our tax revenue, that we start researching this product, um, et cetera, for the health and well-being of the people who are buying and selling it. Yeah, I, Rachel, I think you make some amazing points, uh, you know, and being in both sides of this industry and what I'm, you know, I was been a medical grower for 20 years and I'm in the, you know, adult use side of the industry now. Um, you know, I, I, I got into this industry because of the therapeutic benefit of this plant and, uh, you know, I'm people who maybe weren't so outspoken about their desire to consume cannabis now during 
COVID quarantine, they're all like, hey, you got something that can help me relax? I'm, I need something to chill out. Uh, so it, it's kind of, it, it's refreshing to, to see more people coming out of the closet and even just recognizing the therapeutic benefits of helping to relax some of the stress and anxiety related to everything that's going on right. around us. And so and I, it's okay <laughs> to use it for that reason. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and I think you're right. I, I think a lot of us uh, in the industry have struggled with how do we walk this road of, yes, it's okay to use it as a recreational substance. Like you would go to a bar or hang out with your friends around a campfire or whatever. And it's also recognized that it has the ability to help regrow bone tissue better or, you know, have <laughs> neurons yeah. or treat PTSD or treat cancer. Like it, it's, it's hard because cannabis does so much that it's, it's easy for each individual part of the industry to latch on to one aspect of, of cannabis and really fight for that part of it. I, yeah. I guess the, you know, Kim might want to jump in, but you know, one of the things that, you know, I think that we've been primarily focused on with some laser focus in the industry really is on banking and taxes, uh, you know, and, and mm -hmm. getting back to kind of some of the original problems with, you know, essential business and yet we can't even bank legally and you know it, it, the fact that we can't use digital money right now is actually putting us at higher risk for you know <laughs> contracting the disease um and and so there's yet another reason why banking could be important i mean it's it's small potatoes compared to all of the other issues that we deal with related to that but yeah it i think that we certainly need to be doing better education. We certainly need to be working as as a collective industry with accountability. And and you know we I, I think that we need to try and prioritize ourselves around a few specific goals that you know that are really attainable. And it's it's frustrating to to get into DC and you know we we were treated much better this time uh, than we had been in the past. Uh, this last year when we were there. Um, but, you know, I, I would like to see us be able to collectively come together around a couple of key aspects to, to really hold mm -hmm. people accountable and, and move, move a few key pieces of legislation that I think would be overall really helpful to the industry. At the same time, I'm somewhat con concerned once there's full on banking, uh, those big agribusinesses and those big pharma businesses that have been mm -hmm. somewhat, I'll say on the sidelines, but uh, really um, they're, they're working through their own darker channels right now. They're, they're not so in the, in the open about it, but I do have some concerns that once banking's here, that, that the gloves are going to come off of those big businesses. And if we're not prepared for that, we, we certainly need to start getting there now. As we, as we create that system, we just need to make sure that there's protections and enforcement. So what I learned through a whole lot of collective bargaining is we always get protections, we always get enforcements in the language, um, but we don't usually uh, do the enforcement part. So I think that because we're creating what the standard is gonna look like, this generation is literally on the front line. We're gonna write that language. We're gonna create what do those protections look like um, what do those opportunities for enforcement of safety and providing that those business owners are not um, overrun by those people that have millions of dollars and sitting back on the side just waiting to capitalize off of your effort. Uh, we get to build that language because they're not going to do it for us. Yeah. And we just have to, that's why it's so important to not only when you, when you win, when you win a legislative win, like we did, like making this legal, when we did that, there should never be any question about our ability to have political power and influence. Like we have that. And I'm, I'm just so blown away that the industry seems to still have to jump through hoops to get people that have that political opportunity um, to support us, to sponsor us, to, to back us and to do it openly. Um, I saw last uh, term when, you know, we had the, the voters, uh, the last ballots that came out, 
um, people were still waffling about how they felt about the industry and look where we are right now. And so not to say again that uh, coronavirus is a silver lining, but the fact that it's happening and we are still operational, we are sustainable, we are uh, accessible to our community, utilize that opportunity to become politically strong. And then we'll connect with people like Jesse and people like Dr. Knox and let's build that language so that there is a healthy focus on how it's being uh, grounded into our policy because we need to be the the overseers of that like please we if we're not then it's not going to happen period <laughs> i used to work for capitalists like come on i worked at bank of america <laughs> i know what this looks like in the real world and it's an opportunity for us to just rob y'all so um let's not let that happen let's make sure that how we uh see things happening in the future makes makes sense because we're looking at being protected and making sure that we're beelining investments in education, infrastructure, public safety. When you're putting so much money into those other integral parts of life um, in society, then guess what? If they do come through and they try to do this big buyout, they're the investors in making our society healthier and we'll probably just make money off of our residuals because they'll have to pay us to get in the game. Like hang out, you know? We, I, I, yeah, I, I love what I just love what you just said because I have been trying to tell people for the last two years as the chair of this Oregon Cannabis Commission that we are only going to write the narrative if we collaborate. Like trying to get OLCC and OHA and the industry and the medical population and the legislature, um, law enforcement to see eye to eye is not an easy feat, but we can do it if we just come together. I think there's too many, it's too much division even in this industry. And we all have, you know, I think we all have the right idea and we all have um, our hearts in the right place, but we don't come together and talk no. enough. When I talk, to, when I talk to the health department about public safety after the death of my nephew, and I wondered why we had so many groups around the table, there were 75 different agencies that wanted to stop the violence. Um, and when I said, well, what are you doing to engage with communities on stopping the violence? They were like, well, our job is not to, uh, to raise the kids or to support the families. Our job is to put criminals in jail. And I was like, well, why do you have everybody here? Like they had the education <laughs> system. They had TriMet. They had the health department. They had the parks department. They had, uh, you know, like every industry in the city that you would think would be investing in the equity and the outcomes they were sitting there and they were like, well, our job is to lock them up because the community partnerships were built to survey, to investigate, to interrogate, and in their opinion, keep the community safe, which did not include those children or their families. And we see ourselves um, overrepresented in all of those systems as the evidence. So if we have evidence on the record of how people are treated, um, come on, like, let's not allow this to happen in this industry because we did this together. The industry did not become uh, what it is on its own. We utilized the fact that people were discriminated against and were treated unjustly. Um, and that was a big PowerPoint. And that's why they're doing business with people like the Prosper Portland and all that. Those are still community policing uh, partnerships. That's why they have the aggregate of being able to quantify all of the values of that interest. Um, because that is their interest in a community policing spectrum. They haven't seen past the fact that this is a funding opportunity for law enforcement. They don't know that it's a creative opportunity for innovative economic stability, which we all do, because right. guess what? We're alive. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think we're doing all that bad uh, considering what we, what we believe in. So taking those morals and having something that's actually um, like sustainable and building forward, that, that's why I'm running right now, because I don't want to wait for someone else to tell us the lie that we know is lip service, like Takara said, rhetoric. Um, Madeline is kind of lost in space. I've been trying to connect with her on getting in, and she keeps coming in and, and being lost. So she's not going to be on the call, I guess, um, before we end it. But well, if, she gets on, if she gets on, whoever's on, who, whoever's talking shuts up so she can talk while she's here. Yes, because I wanted her to talk about <laughs> 1944. She's very excited about that. And I was telling her that I saw another petition um, that was basically um, promoting mm -hmm. 
the electronic petitions because it's like okay all the petitions that we put out have to be on the paper and everybody has to print them out sign them and send them in and we know that barely happens so you'll get 10,000 shares and 15 applications of petitions that have been signed so um, I told her that in addition to pushing the IP44 that we need to start looking at innovative ways to become a part of that that movement for the electronic petitions and the signatures for the things that we believe in. Because it's just weird that again, we're in this separate category, but we're supposed to not be in that uh, situation. And at least for local elections, you know, if we want to do something in the county or the city, I know the federal, we have different aspects of legality, so it might be harder, but we need to try to fast pace that actual access to engagement because petitioning works, as we all know. Uh, funny story about Madeline. Um, so uh, Madeline sold, well, actually gave me my first weed plants ever in Oregon 21 years ago. Uh, she happened to be good friends with my first medical patient in Oregon. So uh, I, I just adore her and it's, it's, uh, it's been fun kind of seeing the evolution of weed in Oregon in the last 21 years from the time I first picked up my plants from Madeline's backyard. And, and she at the time had this amazing bush that she had done together or that she had done. And she just kept cutting branches and super cropping and pruning it. So when I came over it, it looked like a freaking cactus. And it was just like 50 colas just all coming <laughs> down short little plants i was just blown away at her ability to manicure such an amazing plant um hey uh i think that teresa we're somewhere around mm, six and eight hundred bucks for you uh wow. yes. given what I've yes. seen coming in and what uh i'm matching for you so hopefully we can get you to that 1200 oh uh, my god yeah, Kevin, I just wanted to say thank you to you for coming by and, and helping out. Uh, and um, I know that you've probably got a drink in your hand because I do. No! <laughs> so I'm whenever, free, we're, man. <laughs> whenever we're at a happy hour together, we both. Can't you see? Uh -huh. I'm in outer space. <laughs> yes, you can't no. drink in outer space. Hey, when you see the Tesla out there, that what's his name? Mm -hmm fired off into outer space grab it for right him. he flew by a little while ago <laughs> and i think woody harrelson's dad's ashes were in it or somebody's ashes were in it. I, don't know. I can't remember <laughs> you, know, you know james you mentioned something earlier it had me thinking and so did teresa about using cannabis to you know as a part of a grieving process or for people of color in general who walk around with ptsd on a daily basis just for being you know of color I think it's really interesting to note that over a million Oregonians would otherwise qualify to be a medical patient, right? One million Oregonians at least carry a qualifying condition to use cannabis as medicine. But an overwhelming majority of these people don't know, don't know that they can do that, don't know that they should do that because of our, you know, the rogue narrative that I like talking about so much. Um, but as a tool for social equity, we don't always talk about the health of our communities of color, right? How strong the stigma is in communities of color because of disproportionate policing. I mean, I've had people tell me there's no way in the world I'm gonna go to a, an adult retail shop because I prefer to go to the, my plug on the corner. I trust them, I know them, I have a relationship with them. Um, so I really, I really hope in this crisis, again, talking about cannabis as an essential business, we can start talking about it as essential because it serves high priority need areas in our communities of color. It serves high priority need areas for our patients. And it serves a high priority need area for just raising money in general. Like I know why it's an essential business <laughs> because of the tax revenue. Like I do not think our government would shut down cannabis for that reason alone. Um, and that's but I think, where you get your leverage. That's why you know you have political leverage. That's why you don't have yes. to sit in line. That's right. And so I just want industry to understand how to wield that leverage now, right? It's our turn to take over the reins and control the narrative and tell everyone just, just how we're going to come together and start talking about cannabis, raising money around cannabis, um, 
disseminating that money from cannabis to do good things in the community. Uh, and that's, I mean, I read that in, in your statements, yeah. um, you know, on, on your positions around cannabis. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. You know, as a medical doctor, I care about the total wellness of a person, not just their medical condition. Like I care about your environment that you have to go home to that contributes to your, your either disease or your health. I care about your social networks. I care about how much money you got in your pocket because all of those things determine how healthy an individual is. And, you know, when I know that we can eat cannabis, we can wear cannabis, cannabis can clean our air, water, and soil, cannabis can make us money, um, then that's what excites me. So how can we all come together and figure this out? Well, I, I have an answer for that. I think that cannabis can help us elect a mayor. And that was one of my plans before COVID-19 <laughs> happened. I've been, I mean, literally for the last 10 years, my relationship with cannabis and my relationship with politics was something that I felt like I could count on because I was like, this industry has had my back personally, politically, um, emotionally, just for so many reasons on so many different levels that I knew and I've been shown every time. I ran for office before for Multnomah County Commissioner because I wanted to work in the health department because I saw all the trauma and I was like, wow, if I could help build people out of trauma through being an inspired leader, a self-servant, a community, you know, a community servant that was helping them, then that would put them into an inspired and encouraged position to be more active and engaged. And then in the four years after I didn't win that, I just started a nonprofit and my nonprofit was the, was named the best nonprofit in the city of Portland for human rights, social justice, uh, really political engagement and everything else. So I didn't get the seat, but I still built up an industry and an organization that was able to serve the needs of tens of thousands of people by providing that type of platform and those type of resources. But I'm tired. I'm so tired. I don't get paid. My staff doesn't get paid. Our community could do so much better because the only thing that's between us and opportunities for moving um, Portland forward and utilizing cannabis as the investment. And I say investment mm -hmm. tool because we're literally growing money. We're literally yeah. growing it. So the fact that we still have children here, that we lead the True. nation with the hungriest children, the most houseless children, unhoused children. Uh, we lead the nation in suicide. My godson killed himself right after my grand, my nephew got killed. Um, we lead the kids. I mean, our children don't even graduate from high school. Um, and it's getting worse and it's gonna get worse with COVID-19. If you don't have leaders with that type of experience, they're gonna always hurt our investment. They're gonna always undermine uh, the values of the people that they serve and I'm tired of it. And the people that know me know that I'm a servant. I don't have ego in this. I don't wish to want to work any harder, but I think that that position gives me an opportunity not to work harder, but to work smarter because we have more resources. The city literally runs itself. You just need a healthy component, which is a courageous leader with you know valuable relationships and, and that necessity of engagement. Uh, we're bringing with us the entire city of Portland, mostly youth, aging community, our disability community, our activist community, our labor community. I mean, everybody that feels like they've had the struggle to have their voices heard knows that there is not going to be resistance in the city hall that I'm the administrator of because I've already built a discourse with community. And one of the most boldest assets that I have is solidarity with people. I am not afraid of people. I love to hear from people. I take value in what people tell me because guess what? I like to understand so that I can do good at figuring it out. Um, I'm built on solving problems. I, like I said, I used to work for an accountant. And one of the reasons that we were in industry was because people had problems in their finance and in their business. Um, I love making things better. I was born and raised in Portland. It could be better. Um, I want to put on the record that this industry can do it. Um, right now, we have the benefit of all of our shops still being open. And so what I'm hoping is that we can get Doc. <coughs> it's not Corona, y'all. <coughs> but we can get Doc to uh, maybe edit this video. And I know there's a lot of displays at some of the spaces. I know people can't go there, but maybe we can shoot it out to some of our networks. Maybe we can all let everybody in our networks know that the last day to register to vote is April 28th. Um, ballots will be mailed out later on after that. And so people will have them in their hand. I recommend voting early. 
Um, I'm always asking people to vote early because what that does is it puts you in a position to quantify your power. You get to say this many people have already turned in their ballots. Let me check in with my networks to make sure that they're part of that, that number. Mm -hmm. um, in the primaries, people usually don't have a big voter turnout. Uh, so that you'll see numbers, you know, coming in on the 19th of May, which is the last day that people can actually uh, cast their ballot. In Portland, we vote from home. This year, we get postage paid <laughs> voting, so nobody has to even leave the house. So I started a campaign called Vote From Home, which isn't hard. I just did a Canva thing and threw Vote From Home on four little logo words. Um, but my thing is, please, uh, no, just don't only donate get people to register to vote, um, ask people to make sure that they use their, their right to vote, and let's stay engaged. Like Takara said, this should be usual and customary. Um, it doesn't cost as much as traveling back and forth to Salem or going to all those meetings. We're at home. Uh, we called this meeting a couple of months ago. We didn't get to have that event, but we had to remind everybody in the last 24 to 36 hours that it was even happening, and we're here, and the information was fortifying um, and the fact that we get to share with so many people is very important. So thanks again. Um, you can learn more information about my campaign at TeresaRayfordForMayor.com. Uh, we put out an extensive people's platform, but of course, a lot of people try to make it through the primaries and then you get a whole lot more teeth in your platform because of the relationships that help you get through the, the primary. So help me get through May 19th so I can run against Ted in November. I'm hoping we don't have to. I think our industry is connected enough to where if we get the vote out, we will win. Um, so let's let's try to win so that we can actually get to work because I'm ready to work. I don't like talking about it. I want to get to it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being on the call. Can I say Thank something? Too. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> I want to talk. This team of people that's on the phone right now, you guys are all like amazing. I'm just looking at all the names and everyone that's here. Like everybody here is just super dope. And to be real with you, um, if we all send out something to our networks, just making sure that everyone in our networks are signed up to vote and that they know about Teresa, like we can hit hundreds, hundreds, if not thousands of people just by the people that are on this phone right now, just by sending out an email so uh if you have an email already put together a campaign email with links to your website and everything like that um if uh your team can get that over to me i definitely will shoot that out and mm -hmm. i would definitely encourage my friends that's all on the phone right now if she sends you guys that email too like let's just do an email blast like what can it hurt to throw something in mailchimp you know we do it a lot with things um and uh i know you know, you, maybe some of you may already be doing that, so that's what's up. But um, yeah, I, just, I will definitely send me what, whatever, and I'll blast it out to my network for sure. Thank you. Thank some you. social media yeah. blasting stuff would be cool, even like a quickie flyer about you, and yes. you know, just some main key points. Um, it's amazing what social media does these days. It uh, it goes a long ways, especially when you're trying to motivate youth to get. <laughs> up off the couch and vote you know unplug the video games for me go ahead and smoke your weed just put down <laughs> video games for a second <laughs> and go vote <laughs> and i was gonna say kevin like one of the most uh active uh youth organizations next up just endorsed me and they're active youth they helped pass the bill that got us the postage on the uh on our ballots and they've helped a lot of other things right. as well when we were pushing for the measures to do legalization they were out doing volunteer work, getting the petition signed. They weren't even, you know, getting paid for it. So the youth I hang out with, the organizers and the activist groups that I hang out with, this next generation, they're ready. They're trying That's to good. put up bed. They're trying to get rid of us. That's why we got to put ourselves in a position <laughs> to give them guidance on the things that they want to do. Because they don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have all a lot of experience. It's just time to channel that out so that we can build on it because we have a very active community here in Portland and I'm ready to help them feel inspired. I don't want them to, to feel like they're not uh, powerful. Um, the fact that they're powering me up so that I can power you up, that's a power plug. I just want Definitely. you all to know that because they yeah, might well put. And they need to know that they do have the courage to inspire a generation to do the work we need to do. 
Well, so. the cannabis community is, you know, I mean, it's, it's really strongly interwoven. It's large. There's a lot of people involved in it, but it's a, it's a really small world when it comes down to it. Everybody seems to at least cross paths and, you know, we can really go a long ways just trying to spread the word. Like, um, like you said, just, uh, you know, get out there and email blast, do whatever we can. Um, you know, small steps sometimes, you know, make some big jumps. So, yeah. this, so th this is Jesse. Um, just, I, I, I do want to just put a little bit of, of numbers in the back of your head. So I, my history is I come from a world of campaigns and campaign politics. And um, there was one of the more compelling things I ever saw is um, undecided voters, something like 75% <laughs> of undecided voters made up their mind of who they were going to vote for by talking to friends and family. Yeah. Did, no mail, it wasn't mail, it wasn't TV ads, it was friends and family. Your voice matters, so use it. Yes, mm. yes. Yeah, for sure, Jesse. And, uh, you know, three, three, to, three degrees of separation, like you said, Kevin, I, we may, I may not know everybody in the industry, but I guarantee I know everybody in the industry from, you know, three degrees of separation. And Teresa, I'm not worried about you with COVID. That was a wet cough, not a dry cough. <laughs> so, oh, no. You're okay. I just diagnosed you over our webinar. Uh, and, uh, you know, I... Uh, That's what Rico, we do. <laughs> These days. <laughs> Takara brings up a great point. You know, this is a fundraiser, guys, I think. Oh, you know, I, from what I've seen, and I don't, I'm sure I, not everybody has chimed in here or, you know, let us know. But, you know, I think there's been about three to 400 donated and I'm matching up the five. Let's, you know, everybody can kick in another 50 bucks or something. Let's, let's get her at least that thousand, preferably that 1200 that it's going to take for a week's worth of campaign ads. And then the last piece <laughs> I wanted to say is, you know, those action items. I think that it's really important that, you know, um, tie kind of at least with, yes. with the, the, 14, 15 people that are on the call here that uh, we all, uh, you know, get some of those blast posts to, to be able to share over our social media networks to get any of those email blasts and, and you know, if there's, and then I'd getting out there and I'd say, you know, even if we can't get out and personally talk to people, like make it a point, you're going to call five people and talk to them about Teresa. So uh, Teresa, thank you for everything you do, and I'll shut up. Now. Well, I, I was going to say that I'm on I'm on the same page with y'all, and I was supposed to be doing a May 19th event at Prism House for a watch party on election night, and so I contacted Sam yesterday, and I said, hey, I know I'm not going to be there. I know you got the money. Keep it, and what I need you to do is uh, create some endorsement uh, flyers for me for the people that are endorsing my campaign in the industry so that we can have those along with the information about the campaign um, to, to put out there. And so if anybody that's interested in saying that they endorse me, send me their information, I'll get it over there to Samantha at Talkativity and we'll have some graphics that'll make it easier. Mm -hmm. And you can share those graphics along with a link and that way people in your community um, can see that, you know, hey, this is my person and they're affiliated with her her branding and there's a lot of information and for now just in case you might want to see it I'm, I'm super long wind because I do a lot of work and like I said I hang out with uh, auditors because I want to know how things work go to my page Teresa Rayford for mayor.com there are there's a ton of information on there but we also in the last 18 months have made like 14 videos to promote our platform so there's like so many videos that not only cover um, my interest in utilizing funds for cannabis to build social change, um, but the entire platform. And based on thousands of responses I got from going out into the community and asking people through a survey, what matters to you? I listened to what those responses came back with. And I went ahead and did some research with a whole lot of people and came up with the people's platform. So please check that out. And then also check out all the videos on our YouTube. I've been releasing like one a week, but they're already on there. Um, and it's so much in-depth information. I'm, I'm just ridiculously long-winded. So I kind of overcompensate. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and with coronavirus, I'm finding more stuff. So y'all have to <laughs> if, you go, if it becomes overwhelming. But I really want to win this seat so that I don't have to continue uh, struggling. We don't have to struggle. I think we just need to get together and start uncomplicating the process of bureaucracy. So again, mm -hmm. thank you. But please check that information out. And I'll make sure that once we get the information from Sam, that we'll send out the new branding for after this conversation. Yay. And I just got like a tokativity thing that says, happy 420. <laughs> like literally, I thought like, Sam, tokativity. So thank you. I think we did it, y'all. We did Yay. it. Anybody, anybody else want to match it? My $100 donation? <laughs> I do want to offer myself for anyone who makes a video or other content for something like this or other informational, if you need interpreters or captioning services to make it accessible, especially right now with the whole world being stuck inside, technology being used more and more to disseminate info is not accessible. So if y'all need help making that happen on any of your ends, you can contact me directly. My email is in the chat. I just wanted to plant that seed for everyone here. Thank I'd like you. to just say how energized I am by this whole conversation um, this evening, and I feel blessed and lucky to have been a part of it. Teresa, you are obviously a woman of great fiber, and um, even though I might not have um, money that I can donate right now, what I do have is a lot of energy, so uh, please use me as you see fit. I'm so inspired by so many of the themes that came up this evening, um, the therapeutic elements of cannabis, the idea of us writing the story together, you know, and that really got me thinking, guys, because, you know, prohibition was all about hijacking the narrative. And if they could change the course of something that quickly by hijacking the narrative, then by God, we can hijack the, nar the narrative back. And right. <laughs> I, I'm very, very inspired by what I heard tonight. So thank you so much for having me along. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for that information. It was so, so, I, I'm thankful. I love it. I oh, my pleasure. Keep me in the loop. Let me know how I can be useful to you. Well, send us the actual documents, and then that way I can spend some time in COVID world uh, looking through it myself. Not the, <laughs> not the uh, PowerPoint. Well, you know, the, uh, the documents where you got that. I'm <laughs> I like using my highlighter. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm happy to share any and all resources. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you too, guys. I'm going to sign off because I have a husband to feed, but it was really great <laughs> being with you all. Awesome. Yay. Yay. So Denise, did you have anything you want anybody to know about the donations or is it going through Act Blue? Is everybody just putting it in Act Blue so Denise has it? I don't know if I have to unmute her. I'm I'm sorry. I um had a had a difficult time unmuting myself. But yes, there's a the the access code was on the the beginning, you know, where the, oh gosh, I'm just tongue tied, where the, <laughs> before the chat, there's an Act Blue link. And so the Act Blue link is the cannabis um, committee. So donate and, and share the information. We, we need your help right now. Um, the campaign is, is uh, it's, it's, it's still moving, but it's limping. So help us out. <laughs> And how, how long is this link active for? How long is this particular fundraising active for? Um, it's good until the 19th of May. I set okay. it off today Perfect. so that we could track how much is coming through the industry. And so it has its own uh, personal, personalized link called PDX Cannabis for Rayford. And so, okay. yay. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Keep up the hard work. Oh God, thank you so much. And it is hard. I'm, I'm just gonna tell everybody thank you and good night. I have my friend Andrew spending so much time communicating for all of us and I don't wanna take advantage okay. of that resource. And so please, if anybody needs to, and I, and I would say that if you can afford it, even if you feel like you don't have a need, open up accessibility in your industry and connect with yeah. Andrew Tolman because we have to make usual and customary what it should be. 
Uh, we can't wait for the bureauc you know, the bureaucrats to say, hey, this is what we need. We know what we need. We need to be open to our community and we need to be accessible for everybody. So thank you. Teresa, was that Act Blue Link the donation for you? Yeah, it goes into the campaign. Okay, all right. I, I thought you said it was something else. I was like, oh no, I was like, I put it in the wrong thing. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> So that's my treasure is on the line. And I okay, all right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, everybody. Good night. Yeah, Thank you night. so much. It was uh, it was great hearing everybody's opinions and everything. Thank it's... you for everybody. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Being here. <laughs> Have a great night. And everybody stay safe. Anything... Thank you, Dr. Knox. Well, anything else we can do too, like virtually, videos, testimonies, stories. Yes, I you have. Know, I'm, I'm at a computer all day long in front of cameras. Um, Absolutely. So. Well, I have a, um, my Timothy, who's on my campaign, that is one of the people that does the phone banking. Timothy, are you on? Yeah, I, yeah. Can okay. you hear me? Yeah, so Timothy's been running phone banking. And so I'm going to send out a, a thing not only asking for endorsements, um, but also with information on what people can do to phone bank, because we have like probably what, nine, 900,000 or 90,000 or something, 5,000. Yeah. So we've got like a ridiculous amount of numbers to call. So um, we're looking for people that have a little time, maybe an hour a week or something. Uh, to just make phone calls to let people know that we're running for office and that we would like your vote. There's a search and everything, so you just have to say. Yeah, we. Timothy, if you put the link to the forum in the chat, that'd be perfect too. Certainly, um, and it's pretty accessible. We have scripts already, um, so if you don't have to really think about it, uh, it's really accessible. I think Jacinda did a really good job. That's our field organizer. And uh, yeah, it's super accessible. So if anybody wants to participate, uh, we just ask that you use like a Google Voice number so you don't have to uh, use your own number and it isn't uh, directly from your phone. It's just attached and you could uh, just use a phone number that has a 503 area code and it's super accessible. So I will drop a link in the chat as well. Awesome. And so, um, again, people that you know, if you have a newsletter, if you have a call list, if you want to uh, promote any of this on social media, I'll have the video pretty soon. Um, and we'll follow up in an email with all the information. And I just really appreciate everybody for being on the line. James, thank you. I love you so much. Um, this is a virtual house party. We have until May 19th and we can do more. So if anybody wants to host another one of these, I would be so down because guess what? Hey. It's a party. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be together soon, y'all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Knox, for coming on. Oh, pleasure. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right, y'all. Bye-bye. Bye, y'all. Bye, I, I want to see this through to the end, too. <laughs> I want to see you there. <laughs> <laughs> me, too. Me, too. It's going to happen. <laughs> I'm feeling very thankful because, uh, like I said, we have another forum event on KTU on Tuesday and at all the forums uh, the response has been really positive for me because I guess I'm telling the truth to people and mm -hmm. everybody else is acting like they're running out of time before they can answer a question so I'm going to keep that up I don't mind being truthful right. with the public and hopefully that'll get us where we need to go especially now with COVID-19 I think people want somebody that they feel like not only can they trust but that they can rely on and that's always been there mm -hmm. so I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to win. We'll get that seat. We'll put it on the record that cannabis made it happen. I don't know how to do my thumb without this stuff messing up. Thank y'all. Good night. <laughs> you know, my hair, you know, my afro keeps I'm disappearing into the kept popping off. <laughs> it literally <laughs> kept disappearing. <laughs> I love your afro, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to have mine back in a couple minutes. Oh, man. <laughs> Night, guys. Oh. All Thank right, y'all. Good night. Looking forward to doing this again. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> My people. Bye, All right. Good night. Tell everyone. Good night, uh, Timothy. I love you. Love y'all. Bye. Good night.